this Sunday after Christmas Day and the Sunday after Easter Day are kind of known in church circles as Low Sunday. I needn't elaborate. I do thank you all who, who, who came, uh, and, and particularly if you had trouble getting yourself out of your driveway and out of your garage, and, and here we are. And I'm sure, too, there are, are many more uh, gathered um, by Zoom. Um, to me, though, to me, when, when Reed said, Would, I couldn't get anyone else to do it, is actually what he said. So <laughs> I said, well, I think I still remember how. It'll, it'll be kind of autopilot. If I can handle the technology, I can handle the gospel. Um, but actually, I said, I'm really glad to do it because I think of all of the Christmas services and all of the Christmas celebrations, this is probably my favorite one. Maybe that's because I'm sort of a theological or intellectual geek, uh, so be it. But to me, it's a time to reflect together in quiet on um, just what it really is that's at the heart of Christmas. What this idea of this doctrine of the incarnation actually means to us in the way in which we're called to live out our lives. This idea of God born of a woman, born in human flesh. And born, and this is what I want to really center on, born as God's gift to us. God's gift to us. Um, I'm not going to talk about the gospel. The, the essay at the cover of the bulletin covers that, I think. I want instead to tackle the epistle, that reading from Paul's letter to a congregation that may not have been much larger than this one in Galatians, a town Galatia uh, in Asia Minor. And imagine there he is writing and, and somehow it's come all the way down through the ages to us. And it's being read all over the world uh, today. What Paul is getting at. And I think what he's getting at is looking at life and living life, all of us, living life day by day uh, as a gift and not as a possession, not as something that we deserve or that we earn or that we merit by being good, uh, but something that's just a gift freely given. You remember Paul, he had this radical conversion, the road to Damascus. He'd been uh, by his own uh, boast, really. He's a, he's a funny guy. He's very boastful, but he also pretends to be very humble, and he's fighting. A lot of fighting going on inside Paul. And he's, he's a zealous persecutor of the Christian movement within J Judaism, uh, and he's a scrupulous observer of every little piece of the law of Moses, because this he saw is how we make ourselves right with God, how, how our life becomes a, a, a righteous life by our doing, by our keeping these rules, by our uh, striving to be perfect. And there are funny things happen when you're that kind of person. And don't think of this, this is not about Judaism versus Christianity, you know? Judaism is the law and Christianity is faith. Um, Paul, Paul was a Jew and he was trying to reform his religion of his day. Um, we are Christians and we too are called to, in some senses, reform and renew. Uh, the religion that we've inherited, that we see talked about and acted out falsely around us, we're, we're called back to something deeper, which is what Paul is getting at. Um, 
So Paul says in his conversion, suddenly he's struck by the fact that he's been going entirely in the wrong direction, that it's not about earning your salvation. It's not about achieving your righteousness. Uh, this is about receiving a gift given to you, not because you deserved it, but because God is gift, God is love. And to make you free, God needs to give to you freely and you need to accept freely. This runs very deep, but think about you because each of us is, you know, we, we're a combination of, of being free people, living by faith, living out of gift and um, people caught in a society which rewards accomplishment which rewards competition and striving. Somebody said to me, we're talking about, I don't know, something in politics. And he said, well, I don't believe in giving anybody something for nothing. Now my life was changed, uh, it's been changed a number of times and, and, and change of heart is a wonderful thing, but two things really changed, particularly how I saw my ministry, my ordained ministry. And one was three trips I made uh, in the 1980s to Nicaragua. It's the only time I've ever been to a third world country. And I couldn't believe what I saw. I couldn't believe uh, both the, the, the helpless poverty of the people and their joy how their lack of bitterness and their love for one another. And the other was being called to minister in a town very near here, but very far away from, from a lot of Hopkinton, where very few people have been to college. And again, I had parishioners living in, in trailer parks. I had a parishioner living literally in a tar paper shack and I was aware of what a strange place America is where people think that if you haven't made it, you haven't tried. Because I saw people trying. I saw people trying very hard. But I saw people who didn't have the chances that I've had. I was, you know, there are a million statistics that you read about this. And one that I saw just recently was that uh, among the uh, classes at Harvard, 50% um, of the students, uh, and they're supposedly admitted on a merit basis alone, um, although merit can include being good at some sport, but 50% of them come from the top 1% economically in this country. And 4% come from the bottom 50%. So this idea of meritocracy that we've built up for ourselves, that if we've achieved something, we've earned it. There's something very, that's, that's not the whole truth. And I think that's what Paul was grabbing at. This wasn't just a religious thing. This was about how you lived out your life. That if you think that everything has been given to you and that the very talents which have enabled you to earn a living and to give back to society, those talents are God's gift to you. And somebody else maybe didn't have those opportunities. So if you think you realize that everything is God's gift to you, then what you realize you need to do is that you need to live a life that pays that forward, that gives to others. Now we do that sacramentally here in, in, in some really good ways in church. Um, I'm looking back there at, at um, somebody, he and his wife uh, organized these blood drives and, and the country's in desperate need of blood at the moment. 
And you know, this is a quiet thing, uh, but it takes organization and it takes showing up. And some of you showed up this morning and you probably thought twice about doing it, um, but you did it because you were here to give back. Well, family promise, the other service things that we do. But at a deeper level than that, this is about changing our lives and supporting each other in a different way of being, a way which gives forward what is given to us. I have a lot of friends who don't get that message. And you know what happens when you think that you've earned it all is you become very possessive. This is mine. And nobody's going to take it away from us unless I let them unless they deserve it. And, and then they become very self-justifying. It's mine because after all, I earned it. I did this. I'm better than you are. And in order to maintain that posture of deserving it, then you have to start putting other people down. You know, I've got more than you because I'm better than you. And I'm better than you because you're not so good. Uh, and you get trapped in what Paul talks about, the prison of self-righteousness. Where you're really dependent entirely on yourself and not on God. This, I think, is why again and again through the Gospels, Jesus talks about how God loves the poor. Because the poor can't depend on themselves. They have to depend on the love of God, the love of God shown through people who know that they've received God's love. So this, I think, is really at the heart of Christmas. Yeah. This gift that came to us 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. A gift we did not ask for, although we longed for it, a gift we did not earn or deserve, a gift freely given that has changed lives through the ages. A closing thought. Some of you probably caught a piece of news before you left home this morning that Desmond Tutu, the great Archbishop of South Africa died at age 90 this morning. And there's an amazing man, you know, he grew up in one of the uh, segregated apartheid uh, townships of uh, Johannesburg. And he tells the story that as a child, he and his mother, who was a laundress, were walking down the street. And a white man came to pass them and tipped his hat to his mother. And the white man was named Trevor Huddleston, and he was the Archbishop of Cape Town. And Desmond Tutu who had wanted to be a doctor, but whose family couldn't afford to send him to medical school, said, if this is what being a Christian is about, then I want to be a Christian. And the rest is history. A man who gave himself to reconciliation, to love, to hope. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we are no longer slaves, but children. And if children, then also heirs through God.